the Minister for outlining the, the Government amendments, and I have to say I think you're doing a great job, Minister, and I really do appreciate the great work that you are doing on this, um, and you can be assured of my support um, for all of your amendments. But I would like to speak now on numbers 4, 7, 8, 9, 12, 38, 39 and 40 um, in this grouping. So is that okay, Lasky Herlock? Four, seven, eight, and nine, yes. Yes. They're okay, yeah. So can I just start by, because I would like to thank Senators Rose Conway Walsh, Myra Devine, Paul Gavin, Port McLaughlin, Trevor O'Clarta, Neil O'Donnell, Fintan Warfield, Alice Mary Higgins, Colette Hel Kelleher, David Norris, and Grace O'Sullivan for joining with me to table these and subsequent amendments. Many of us have been working as part of our cross-party group on alcohol harm, and this is a, t a time when politics is really good, when we work together for public good and for the good of our country. Um, a very special thank you again, Minister, to, your, Minister, to you and especially to your officials, uh, particularly for the briefing that you organised yesterday. Um, I want to welcome to the gallery Siobhan Creighton from the Royal College of uh, Surgeons or Physicians of Ireland, Catherine Keane and Suzanne Costello from Alcohol Action Ireland, and Brian Allen from the RISE Foundation. I really want to thank Alcohol Action Ireland and the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland for their tireless work over the years to guide us to this point, and in particular their support for my work in this area. Um, and not also forgetting Professor Frank Murray and uh, Professor Joe Barry. I also extend a very warm thank you to the wide range of public health campaigners who have come together as the Alcohol Health Alliance with a mission to reduce the harm caused by alcohol. I want to say a very special thank you to Senator Gillian Van Turnout for her assistance personally to me on this issue. Um, in my manifesto, I committed to being a voice for the, run of, for the vulnerable, and this bill is one of the priority areas for me. I will be sharing with you a glimpse of the work of the RISE Foundation, which is work that is focused on family members who have a loved one with an alcohol problem. Children living with parents who drink in a harmful manner are, am are amongst the most vulnerable in this society. This is something I'm extremely passionate about, as you well know, Minister. The wide range of harms that are caused to children as a result of harmful drinking in the home is known as hidden harm, as the harm is not often visible in public and largely kept behind closed doors. I have examined the evidence and I hold the life stories of the most vulnerable and so it is with confidence I stand here, Minister, to say both my head and my heart fully support this bill and the package of measures it contains. The amendments I put forward are to strengthen the bill and I hope I am successful. However, at the very least, let's not water down this bill. Um, this morning in the Irish Examiner was a powerful letter by John Higgins, who was the father, to his 19-year-old son David, who died by suicide in March 2011. In his letter he said, Dear Sir, in the coming week the Public Health Alcohol Bill will go to committee stage in the Shannon. After the decision by the Court of Session in Scotland to clear the way for minimum unit pricing to be introduced in Scotland, there is now a very distinct possibility that minimum unit pricing may well become a reality in Ireland. There is still a chance that the alcohol industry will challenge this ruling in the UK Supreme Court. No doubt the lobbying to minimise the effect that the Public Health Alcohol Bill would have on the price, availability and promotion of alcohol in Ireland has gone to another level. If that is possible, seen as it has been unrelenting since the early days of the birth of this bill. We read of IBEC and the alcohol industry submitting amendments to the bill. They say structural separation of alcohol and retail outlets would be costly and unmanageable, and that as a result, as a result jobs, jobs could be lost. They also say that minimum unit pricing won't work. They also believe advertising rest restrictions are too strict. The purpose of this bill in its entirety should not be lost to the pressure of lobbying and perhaps threats of job losses and closures. This bill will save lives, it will reduce consumption, it will help to minimise the continuous bombardment of our children and grandchildren by alcohol companies advertising their product. We can attribute three deaths per day to alcohol abuse. 500, 547 hospital bed nights every year are occupied by people suffering from alcohol-related illness, illnesses, and alcohol is a contributing factor in at least 50% of suicides. It states on his death certificate that alcohol was a contributing factor in his death. That information is there for a reason, and I write this letter for that reason. 
That's the end of the letter. And I just think we should remember David and John Higgins and all the other families who are impacted by alcohol-related harm. And just coming back to the amendments of 4, 7, 8, 9, 38, they're all inter interrelated. These amendments deal with the av availability of free alcohol when another service is paid for, e.g. free wine when you get your nails done or hair done, free beer in the barber or free alcoholic drinks when you buy special cinema tickets. Many of the businesses who are offering free alcohol with the service are not licensed premises, so therefore should not be supplying alcohol in this manner. The provision of free alcohol in barbers or hair saloons, etc., highlights the increased role alcohol plays in our daily lives. Alcohol is heavily promoted, widely available, and very often given away for free, as if it were just another ordinary risk-free product. While the level of public awareness and understanding of many of the serious health problems associated with alcohol is quite low. The Healthy Ireland survey recently published found that just 16% of women were aware of the links between breast cancer and alcohol consumption. The National Con Cancer Control Programme found that 12% of all breast cancer over the course of a decade in Ireland were associated with alcohol consumption. I just want to also give an example of a young woman as a therapist in the Rutland Treatment Centre that I worked in who was really, really struggling with alcohol because she was a wine drinker. She used to drink wine. Now, I know we all think of somebody who is the alcohol, alcoholic on the street, roaming around the streets. This was a, a functioning woman who had small children. And the biggest problem for her was walking past her local shop or going to her hairdressers, or going to the cinema. She wanted to do things where there was no alcohol, and it was impossible for her to do. So that alone, I mean, just the, the energy that she would have had to put into that, Minister, was, was absolutely soul-destroying for her. You walk into a hairdresser, she has her child with her, there's a glass of wine given to you, you walk into the cinema, it's the same thing. Everywhere you go, it's alcohol. Even Holy Communions today, we have the marquee out the back, and there's alcohol all over the place. So I just feel that it's vital that we look at these amendments and for these reasons alcohol given away for free with the service should be prohibited under the bill. And then coming to amendments 39 and 40 in relation to advertising on television and radio, I welcome the government amendments 36 and 37 and support them as they are as to a similar purpose. It has now been established beyond all reasonable doubt that alcohol marketing influences drinking behaviour, particularly among children. The WHO, the World Health Organization, states that exposure to alcohol marketing increase, increases the likelihood that young people start to drink alcohol and that among young people who have started to use alcohol, such exposure increases the frequency of drinking and the amount of alcohol consumed. An NUI Galway study commissioned by Alcohol Action Ireland provides a recent and important insight into the experience of a large sample of Irish children aged 13 to 17 year old with alcohol marketing. The results show that 91% of the children surveyed reported that they were exposed to traditional offline alcohol advertisements, including television, in the week prior to the study and more than half reported that they were exposed to four or more advertisements per day. And in actual fact, yesterday there was a great example given in the AV room where somebody talked about asking their child would they know about branding of cigarettes and they wouldn't have had a clue. And yet if you talk about the branding of alcohol and they can ream them all off what brandings there are out there. For, this is a young child. Um, at present, there is no statutory protections in place to protect children from alcohol advertising on television and radio, and the current self-regulatory system is not working. Part of breaking the close links between alcohol and sport is to remove alcohol advertising from being shown during televised sports events, in addition to bringing an end to alcohol sponsorship of sports. Television is the most popular channel for watching sports, and the current system of self-regulation fails to protect children watching sports events on television from exposure to alcohol advertising. So thank you very much, Minister.